Hello listeners, welcome to our podcast series. Today we have Mr. Mahesh Varan, Shamiga Sundaram, Country Manager, Varunas. Hello Mahesh Varan, welcome to our podcast series. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for this opportunity again, Samapita. Thank you so much for coming to this podcast series. Can you tell us about Varunas and the services it provides? Sure, Samapita. So, Varunas is a 18-year-old company. We established ourselves in 2005. Headquartered in New York. We are listed in NASDAQ for over nine years. Globally, we have over 8,000 plus customers uh, and we do about 430 million in annual recurring revenue. And uh, uh, in India, we established operations in March last year. Um, and uh, uh, we now have presence in Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, and Chennai. And as a product or as a platform, uh, you know, we're on, on predominantly help customers to. Uh, get answers to these three uh, so-called simple questions. I'm using the word so-called because it's very tough for customers to come with, come up with answers to these questions without a tool like Veronis. So one is to help customers know what data is important for them and where is it deciding. Two, help them to uh, be sure that only right users are accessing information with right permissions. And lastly, also help customers to track how information is used. And we strongly believe that if customers start understanding normal data access patterns and look for suspicious activity, they'll be able to predict a lot of breaches and contain. So through our platform, we help customers to get the much needed visibility around what data is important, where is it residing, uh, help customers to reduce their blast radius or attack surface and ensure that there is a least access principle uh, uh, model enforced around information. And lastly, uh, also detect complex insider threats, ransomware threats, Etc. and help them to improve their compliance stature. So that's in a nutshell is what we do with our offerings. So yeah. other than the product uh, from uh, Veronis, we also do have uh, professional services where we firmly believe that it's important for us to uh, ensure that we measure customer satisfaction and ensure customers get maximum value out of the investment they're making with us. So normally uh, through our professional services, uh, services team uh, and along with our channel partners, trained channel partners, uh, we ensure that the product is deployed, configured, and supported well, so customers get maximum value out of the investment that they're making with us. And we also offer proactive incident response as a service, which is something unique to us. So for every SaaS customer of ours, uh, our proactive incident response team engages with them at no additional cost and help them to uh, proactively know about any serious incidents that we are seeing, or the customers can take help around any investigation analysis uh, around Veronis as a platform. So that is enough. These are certain services that we offer to our customers. That's interesting. That is really great. So what is your vision for the India market? So like I said, uh, we established our operations only in March. So we had zero customers till March last year. So I'm, I'm, I'm the first employee. So the vision that we have for India as a market is to establish ourselves to be uh, uh, the go-to brand for customers when it comes to data protection, data governance. Uh, ensure that we create the right ecosystem for our employees as well as channel partners so that they remain productive and efficient. And also, uh, especially for our partners, they uh, make the relationship with us extremely productive and uh, uh, profitable. Uh, lastly, uh, um, you know, we, we want to, uh, you know, grow the business significantly and ensures, uh, you know, India contributes to at least five percentage of our APAC revenue in the next uh, three years time. So these are uh, certain visions uh, that we have and certain goals that we have uh, for us to demonstrate, uh, you know, constant success on our That's great. And I'm sure you will achieve your mission. So according to you, what are some major achievements that are worth mentioning? Yeah. So I think, uh, firstly, as a company, um, we moved into SaaS uh, pretty recently. In fact, we launched our SaaS platform for uh, file servers and O365 uh, uh, only this year, um, in January this year. And uh, we have seen, um, you know, we executing things extremely well. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, this was even reported uh, in our quarterly uh, earnings call. 31 percentage of our revenue in Q1 came actually from SaaS. And I think it's a significant achievement, mostly because, uh, you know, when we just launched this platform uh, to execute things uh, uh, the way we did and ensure that we got returns, it's really commendable is what we think. So that's one significant achievement that I just wanted to highlight. I mean, the way we uh, ensure that our SaaS platform is is already demonstrating a lot of value to our customers is really commendable. Two, I think uh, 
um, we have been extremely successful in getting the right partners on board, specifically in India. Uh, and, and I think uh, those relationships are helping us to be uh, really successful in just meeting new prospects, uh, engaging with the new customers, and also realizing wins at a much faster rate. So I think um, um, just wanted to thank uh, the entire team and also on channel partners to make this happen. I think we, we are uh, sort of having the right ecosystem for us to grow and scale our business. Uh, is what I think some of it are. These, I, I would say, are, are the two key achievements. And one of the things specific to India is, since Veronis was not known as a brand very well earlier, I think we have done certain things through our uh, partners, when we are partners, to ensure that we are building Veronis as a brand also in the market. And uh, start and customers and partners have started recognizing Veronis and what exactly it does and what problems it predominantly solves for customers. That's great. And I'm sure you will achieve that. And uh, so even though data security is a crucial component for any business, what are the major roadblocks that you face while convincing CISOs to adopt data security solutions? Right. So I, I think um, uh, there's a significant change in mindset with the CSO, CISOs, CXOs, because I think data security or in general, cybersecurity is becoming a, a you know business, directly translating to business risks and business risks and it's becoming a boardroom discussion. So, uh, I mean, I would not say that we have to go through the process of uh, convincing customers to treat cybersecurity or data security seriously. But how to make data security effective is an area where I think we can add a lot of value. And there is a lot of confusion too uh, with customers because different, uh, uh, cus different partners, different uh, OEMs suggest different strategies and customers really get confused on what should they prioritize and how should they be going about uh, uh, approaching data security. Considering the investment that they've already made around data security and cybersecurity, it becomes a challenge for them uh, to go and keep constantly asking for more budgets uh, and improve their data security framework. So that, I think, is a concern more than they're treating data security to be a serious issue. However, so, so the way we approach this is, uh, you know, what we recommend customers to evaluate their current data security posture, considering the way the attack surface is evolving. I mean, um, things pre-COVID and what's happening now is completely different in the, day, in the way users are engaging with data, businesses are approaching uh, 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 data requirements. Uh, so, so I think it's very important for organizations to evaluate their data security posture, considering the attack surface that exists, that exists right now, and see whether the investment that they've made, maybe two or three years back, is it still relevant? And we believe that it's very critical for uh, security pra practitioners and CISOs to have more and more controls around data and users because these are now the two uh, perimeters, I would say. These have become the perimeters for organizations. Users are accessing data from anywhere and any device, and businesses are, are mandating IT and security organizations to make this possible for them, for them to be more productive and efficient. So it's very, very critical for organizations to have as many controls as much as they can around data and users. And if they do that, then I think they'll be able to, um, you know, like I said, get answers to those questions, which will, uh, the three questions, which is to know what data is important, where is it residing, how is it being accessed, uh, are only people with right permissions access information, are they only authorized to access information or not? And lastly, if they also try to understand how information is used, they will be able to predict a lot of breaches. And I'll explain this with an example. Like say, for instance, if an organization understands what is the normal behavior of a user when it comes to that user engaging with data. Uh, now, the user becomes rogue, or if the user credential gets compromised, the behavior of that user is going to significantly change. Like say, for instance, if a ransomware gets access to that particular user credential, it's probably going to log in from a new geography, a new device that the user never logged in before. It's going to maybe access a lot of data types that the user never touched before. It's going to encrypt a lot of data in a shorter duration, which is, again, a not, uh, not a normal behavior of the user. So all these anomalies can probably be helping them to detect that it could be a ransomware threat or it could be a credential compromise and they would be able to contain that threat before it creates a significant impact. And that's where I think uh, it's, it's critical for organizations to have as many controls around these three areas that I just mentioned. Uh, discover classification, permission mapping, and track data usage. If they do that, I think they'll be in much better state uh, to establish effective data governance frameworks and contain or predict data breaches significantly. Yeah, that was really insightful. So coming on to the next question, what automation means for cybersecurity and your business? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think 
automation is playing a huge role uh, in in shaping up cybersecurity. I would say um, uh, the biggest change in threat landscape, I would uh, in, in especially in the last two years, is the speed with which attacks are happening, uh, and and that's making really uh, 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 the security practitioner's job really tough in detecting to threats and responding to threats. So automation is heavily used by the hacking teams. They're becoming more and more organized. They're investing on uh, uh, tools, uh, AML tools to make uh, attacks possible, uh, attacks faster, and achieve the outcome that they have in mind uh, much, much faster. So this means uh, that uh, the hacking community are coming up with a more organized way to uh, you know, compromise organizations. And it's important for organizations also to be prepared to detect such threats faster and respond to it. So, so considering the skill shortage that exists with cyber community, it's it's going to be automation is going to play a huge role in 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 helping organizations to detect and respond to threats much faster, ease a lot of operational overheads uh, much much faster. So, the core areas where I think automation is going to play a significant role, especially in cybersecurity, is like I said earlier, uh, tracking anomalous behavior and helping customers to detect such anomalies much faster. I think automation can play a huge role because the ML models can learn uh, normal behavior of users, normal behavior of assets, and whenever they see a deviation, they can detect an alert and contain that behavior faster. So automation will play a significant role there. And I also think automation will play a huge role in helping customers to detect threats faster and respond to them much faster. So that we call that as mean time to detect threats and mean time to respond to threats. Uh, so um, with the AML models, like I said, tools are going to be much enhanced in detecting threats. And with uh, automation in place, organizations can orchestrate a lot of controls to go and mitigate threats. Like say, for instance, if they think a user credential is compromised, the automation can play a huge role to automatically go and lock that user account from different applications that particular user has got access. If they see a machine to be compromised, they can automatically isolate the machine, investigate what exactly is wrong with that particular machine before connecting the machine back to the network. So all these things were happening earlier, but there was a lot of human human intervention, and it depends upon the uh, uh, the skill set that the person the uh, the person who's actually analyzing the incident has to uh, respond to that particular incident faster. But automation is going to make all of this much easier, is what I think. And one other area where automation will also play a huge role is on increasing awareness levels of users, um, because uh, like I said, cybersecurity skill set is uh, a big issue. There's a huge scarcity in this domain. Uh, so it's important for us as a community to improve and enhance cybersecurity skills, and automation can play a significant role. I'm not saying this was not happening earlier, but most of the awareness campaigns were passive. But with automation, um, they, uh, I mean, organizations or cybersecurity practitioners can simulate a lot of attacks, see how users respond, and actively enforce awareness campaigns as and when they're about to make a mistake. Like say, for instance, if there is a phishing email, and if somebody is trying to click a link in that email, at that moment, automation can be used to tell them what is the risk that uh, they could have brought for themselves or for the organization by clicking that link and why is that link malicious. So this awareness becomes more relevant and uh, uh, probably more effective because it, it's, it's going to happen as and when the user is about to make a mistake. So I think automation, again, um, uh, is going to play a huge role in improving awareness levels. To summarize, I think three core areas is where I think automation will play a key role. One is to track anomalous behavior, two is to detect and respond to threats much faster, and lastly, to improve awareness levels of, uh, you know, employees or end users. But uh, AI ML can be used to detect normal behavior to protect from cyber crime. But how automation can help turn the right information into action, helping to defend against cyber attacks, mitigate risk, show up compliance, and improve productivity? Yeah. So yeah, so I, I think um, you know a, a, with any technology, uh, it's it's also important to see how exactly the technology is leveraged to ensure that it does not create additional operational overheads. It's of the whole intent of uh, you know leveraging automation is to exactly uh, do what you just said. I mean, I'll just explain this with an example. Um, every organization has got a, a SOC framework in place, I mean, Security Operations Center where they collect events from different uh, assets, applications, uh, and then uh, uh, coordinate activities to detect threats and respond to them. So without automation, there was a lot of manual intervention uh, in terms of collecting events, in terms of configuring uh, the tool to ensure that they correlate events effectively, 
uh, so they can detect threats and respond to threats faster. With automation, uh, uh, I would say the effort of effort to achieve this is, is almost um, you know reduced by almost sixty to seventy percent because of leveraging automation in ensuring that the organizations are collecting a lot of events, but only the right events are analyzed. Uh, uh, like say, for instance, there is a ransomware attack, like I said earlier. Um, it, the events get collected from different uh, sources. It could be from endpoints. It could be from uh, you know the Active Directory where the user actually logs in or the malware actually logs in. It could be data sources that ransomware actually touches. It could be applications which where uh, data is residing and ransomware is trying to compromise that particular application or data behind that application. So with automation, what happens is automatic events from these different assets gets collected. And it also understands what's the normal behavior of that particular asset or the user that the malware is trying to use to compromise it. And it looks for a significant deviation. Like say, for instance, if the malware is trying to come from a new geography, uh, which has never happened before. I mean, the user is coming from a new geography or the machine from where the login is happening is from a new geography, which has never happened before. Automation can easily detect and then alert uh, the SOC team that this is happening. Then if the machine is touching a lot of data types that uh, it has never touched before. Automation, again, can quickly alert and make that SOC team aware of it. If uh, the machine is trying to laterally move or the user credentials are being used by multiple machines within the same organization, and that has never happened before, that could be an alert that organizations can leverage through automation. So all these were still possible earlier, but the time to detect such anomalies took a lot of was significant, and that's why uh, you know, hackers probably were able to dwell longer in an organization, uh, uh, you know, escalate privileges and get data. But now, with if organizations leverage automation appropriately, they'll be able to detect such anomalies faster and uh, get the right uh, events or uh, for them to analyze, respond to them much faster, and orchestrate controls much faster to mitigate threats easily. So that's that's about uh, you know addressing the threat aspect. You also touched upon uh, two, two other aspects, which is compliance and productivity. Uh, so with compliance, with most compliance frameworks, uh, the following would be important. One, a discovery of regulatory information and automatically classifying them. And that's where, again, automation can play a huge role, where it can go and scan different data stores where regulatory information is, help customers to get that visibility, and also uh, you know, automatically classify them. So that's one part. The second thing would be to enforce access control. So if there is a regulatory information, ensure only right people have access to that and uh, inappropriate access or unauthorized access is automatically revoked. So that's another area where automation can play a huge role in ensuring that regulatory information is only accessed by authorized users with right permissions. Thirdly, most uh, uh, regulatory frameworks demand or mandate uh, incident reporting or disclosure. So whenever there is a breach, if it happens, then the regulatory authorities have to be notified within a certain duration. Uh, so that again is going to play a huge role because they have to detect those threats faster as and when those breaches happen. And they also have to report what exactly has been breached, where again, automation can play a significant role, considering this is a, uh, uh, in a mandate given by most regulatory bodies. And, and lastly, data subject access request, a right to information, right to erasure, which is again, is going to be mandated by most uh, regulatory frameworks, including the impending data protection bill. So if a consumer wants uh, the organization to go and erase all information that that particular organization has about them. So then uh, doing this manually is going to be a humongous task. So automation can again play a huge role in fulfilling those data subject access requests and better enhance to compliance. So like I said, automation is going to make a, a lot of things easy and also make employees much more productive and reduce a lot of operational overheads. But at the same time, uh, since it's a technology, it also has to be uh, you know, evaluated properly. When I say evaluated properly, not just have a short-term focus to fulfill something that is a need for them right now to achieve automation, uh, but look at holistically uh, in terms of organization's culture, uh, what what exact business problem is an organization trying to solve, not just now, but for, for instance, two to three years time and make appropriate investments uh, to ensure that uh, automation investment that an organization is making is future-proof and uh, it's also important to have a constant human intervention to see whether the results thrown by the automated tools are effective. It's not creating false positives. Those automated models have to be constantly fine-tuned to ensure it's current and future-proof. So those are a few things that are important to make automation effective is what I think some of it. Thank you for explaining in such detail. Well, that marks the end of our session. 
Thank you for joining us today. That session was really insightful and I'm sure the viewers enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amarpita. Thanks once again for this opportunity.